my, my thing is just don't be a douchebag because I was that douchebag. Power to Live More with Joe Dodds. Welcome to the Power to Live More podcast, all about productivity, organisation, well-being, energy and resilience. I'm Joe Dodds and I started this show to enable interesting people to share their stories about how they use their power to live more and by that I mean to do the stuff that they want to do more than the stuff that they need to or should do. It's about creating a life for yourself where you have the energy, health and space to be happy and fulfilled, spending your time as you'd like, whether that be at work, home or somewhere else entirely. That's your choice. Hello. My name is Ellie Dodds and I'm co-presenter and today Joe is interviewing Mohammed el Because of his path, Mohammed views success as a means of helping others. He regards success and winning as a moral duty that enables people to help others. He believes that being humble makes you strong and that being strong makes you happy. Mohammed's accomplishments came despite the fact that he is an average person, which means that by following his advice, anyone can achieve success. A firm believer in Stoicism philosophy, he truly strives to challenge people to think differently about what freedom and success mean. After generating $1 billion in sales while remaining true to himself, Mohammed is on a mission to teach people about the real meaning of success and freedom and how they can obtain them. He is an angel investor who is always on the lookout for worthy businesses to support and for partners to work with. He wants to share his personal story to inspire others to persevere despite obstacles. He also wants to share the tools that can help you reach his same level of success and beyond while maintaining a sense of freedom. Back to the studio. Today I'm interviewing Mohamed El Khamisi. Welcome Mohamed, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So start by telling us who you are, what you do and crucially where you do it. Uh, I'm currently based in Qatar. Um, I run um, one of the, uh, let's say, uh, one of the top five construction companies in the region. We do about uh, $600 million in, uh, a year in sales. I moved here in 2014, uh, moved from Atlanta with my wife uh, and my two kids. I uh, didn't expect to be here that long, but here I am and um, I'm just seeing, seeing where it takes me. Uh Aha. And so most of my interviewees at the moment are working from home. What's the situation over there? We're recording this in December. It won't be going live until April. Um, Are you you, uh, construction in the UK is outside of the rules? People have, uh, well, not all of the rules. (laughs) You still have to take care and be distanced and everything else. But uh, construction has continued. Uh, What's the situation in Qatar? It's, it's, it's pretty challenging because we have the we have the World Cup, so we have some strategic projects coming up, so we really can't do it from home. So we try to rotate, we test a lot, um, but it's, it's, it's become a norm right now, So because it's, it's been going on for such a long time. Yes. Yeah, but, we, but we never stopped. No. You know, so, yeah, so we just kept going. Yes, yeah, so much the same as, as over here in terms of the sort of construction side of things. Right. So how did you end up doing this is it something that was a dream you're always going to be in construction when you were at school and so on or is it no 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 actually see, I, gra- I graduated in 2001 actually in, in September of 2001 right when the yeah. attacks happened in New York and yeah. I was actually in Atlanta yeah. so um I always tell the story no, no one ever took my call you know my so it was useless like I wouldn't I can get an intern because that name was just like uh, the worst thing that can ever happen to anyone at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had no choice but to try to do something. So uh, I tried to do something on E-Trade. Back then it was called E-Trade, some stocks. And I lost my ass doing it. And so, so the only other thing to do was to get into construction, but only small, these small flipping type homes, you know, like where you put 10,000 and 15,000 bucks. Uh-huh. And I started doing that. I still lost a lot of money doing that. But at least I got to meet people which then gave me a chance to actually get an intern and that, 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 but that's how it worked. But I just fell in love with it then. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, not many people start working in an organization, um, get, you know, to be so senior and also move halfway across the world. <laughs> how did that, that happen? Do you know, um, one thing that I, I, I really like and this is why I'm doing this podcast is I, I've always believed in the power of, I don't want to use the word networking, but just knowing people in general. 
you know, yeah. so I've kept, so I was looking out with, my daughter was sick for a while. Uh, it was very tough for two years in Atlanta and we just needed to change the scene. And so I was looking for somewhere where I can fit in the middle, you know, so, so I can be American, but I'm also Middle Eastern. And mm -hmm. so this job just came up and it's just, I kept pushing it. I knew the people from, from the company. Um, I went to school with them. And I just, I kept forcing the issue for them to give me a shot. On it. And then I, I started in a small, it's, it's a group of companies. So I, they took me, they gave me a shot at the smaller company. And within six months, I was, I was in the big, I was in the corporate company. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that I'm special or anything. So it's, it's, I'm average, but, and it's not that I hustled, but it's just the power of knowing people and trying to go out there and kind of force your luck kind of thing. Yes, yeah. And so aside from from what you're doing in your corporate role, you have some other sort of more altruistic, oh no, not, not more altruistic, your company might be altruistic in <laughs> itself. <laughs> but um, you you have um, a, a female entrepreneurship fund. Tell us more yeah. about what, what that's all about. It's about uh, when, when, when my daughter was sick, um, I just, I realized that the difference between my wife and myself. So I just realized how much of a beast she is compared to me. So I, I, I could whine about a dental appointment or a headache or a long day at work versus when she was going through, you know, my daughter's cancer for two years yeah. uh, and, and during the recession. OK, and during a recession, which is, you know, the real estate recession, it was in 2008, 2009. You know, she didn't whine once. And so it hit me. I'm like, man, so she is really strong. You know, she may not have my muscles, but she is really strong. And so I said the best thing to do is when I can afford it what with knowledge and a bit of capital. One thing I want to do, especially on this side of the world is like, I created this fund, which goes live next year, uh, to help women entrepreneurs anywhere in the world, any ethnicity, anything, um, that just want to learn how to run businesses, you know, for themselves. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, so they call it angel investing because I've been doing angel investing for a while, but I don't want to call it anything cliche, but that's the actual cause. Mm -hmm. and, and again, how did you sort of go through the process to do that? Because people many well some people would be interested in creating you know funds to help people and and you know um, foundations and all that sort of stuff but again not everyone does that and you have said already that uh you say that you're um did you use the word normal <laughs> maybe yeah not. average yeah average sorry yeah um but but you're doing sort of what would be seen as as above average things I mean this is something that people lots of people might want to do but don't actually ever get around to, to doing how did you know what to do and how did you keep pushing through to make it happen by being practical and just being honest about what you're trying so you don't need to compare yourself to a foundation if I'm gonna and I use the word fun what I really mean is that if if, if, if I can change you know 20 or 30 women's lives through their businesses I've, I've achieved my target if it becomes 30,000 women, I'm a happy man. So do, do you see what I mean? Like, we, we put all these barriers because we're always comparing ourselves to what we see either in social media or TV. Yes, you know, so it's easy. For, so forget, if, if, I, if, I, if I took the word fund out of it and just said, here's some capital that I want to invest with women, does it change the conversation? Yeah, it kind of dilutes it for some. But the reality is it's the same thing. If I put 10 bucks, 10,000 bucks with this person and sit on Zoom with her and teach her all the stuff that I know, it's the same thing if I call it a fun So People pull all these barriers for themselves to yeah. move. Yes. You know, because that's, that's the problem. Yeah. You just got to do it. Yeah, yeah. And um, you've, you've written a book. You've got a book. Tell us more yeah. about that. Given, given where I grew up and given, you know, given trying to be centralist and everything, um, I, I wrote a book about designing your life to be free. So I kept thinking about this a lot, especially with this pandemic. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 twofold. It's how do you how do you, defining happiness and being free, and living life as an athlete. Let, let's talk about the athlete part because that's an that's a, that's very important. If if you live your life as an athlete that doesn't retire, what I mean by that is if you view a stadium of a hundred thousand people, fans, okay, some of them envy you, some of them hate you, some of them love you, some of them cheer you on, and list goes on, which you meet on your every day, okay. And if you look at your opponent as every every single thing that you have to do, like getting on this podcast, getting here on time or, uh, you know, working out or losing weight or lesson on drinking, all that are these opponents that you meet every day. Mm -hmm. And if you see your life as like you can train as much as you want and practice and do everything right. Yet on game day, 
someone scores in the last second, or you actually get hurt. But you don't quit. You just keep going. And you don't play for one trophy, right? You, keep, you just keep, no athlete just says, okay, I've won this, I'm done. You know, other than when we're talking about re retiring for age. Mm -hmm. So I started, I started building it like that because I was an athlete. I thought I was going to be a soccer player. Right. And that was taken away from me, um, very, you know, after college. And so I kept, I kept trying to, you know, to stick to the, to the principles of that throughout my life, you know, so I never, I never, I don't, I don't accept losses and I don't think about losses or, you know, to me, I just keep going. And the other part of designing it to be free is like, what really makes you happy? It's a very tough conversation. A lot of people run away from that. So is it, is it just financial freedom only? Is it health, uh, you know, freedom or mental freedom? There's just so many, so many aspects of it. So I just, I'm, I, in, in the book, I just asked these questions and how I tackled them myself. Yes. Yeah. Being so average again, I just, I always want to hit that too. That a, there's nothing special about me. No looks, height, nothing. No, I'm not even that wealthy. You know, it's just I'm average in everything. So that's, that's the conversation I, in the book I, I stress on a lot. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting talking about the living life as an athlete thing. I was listening to a podcast uh, over the weekend, um, the Diary of a CEO um, and Stephen Bartlett, the podcaster, was interviewing, uh, oh, I've just forgotten his name now, um, Joe Wicks, who you probably haven't heard of in Qatar, but he did uh, live exercise classes on video every day of the lockdown for X number of days. And he's had millions and millions and millions of views. And uh, he was quite successful already, but all of a sudden everything just went completely mad. And he was referring back to a podcast. I think this was the one it was on um, where he was talking about somebody had interviewed Johnny Wilkinson, who is the rugby player and who um, was talking about how if he'd spent the rest of his life uh, relying on being like the best rugby player in the world, as soon as he wasn't playing professional rugby anymore, all of his meaning in his life would have would have gone. Correct. And I, I guess that's the difference between sort of focusing on having that position, if you like, or taking the the learning and the philosophies and applying that. Because if you think about not being the af athlete that was going to win something or or be a professional athlete and actually just take the principles and the habits, right. that's probably more useful for the longevity of your sort of um, attitude in life, I guess. Where, where did that come from for you that, that you didn't just go, right, I was a footballer, I'm not anymore, move on. And you, instead of that, you, you kept those philosophies alive. Throughout, uh, so throughout my, you know, uh, let's say from the age of 11 all the way up until 24, I viewed myself as an athlete and I was treated as an athlete and I played for a division once uh, team in, in, in the US. So I always had that special treatment, mm -hmm. you know, you know, where, and so that was a result of me being disciplined. Yeah. So when, when, they, when, when the game was taken away from me, I just missed the discipline part. It's, you know, it's so easy when, when it's defined. So if, if you, to lose one kilo, here's what you need to do. It's mm -hmm. easy to think like that. So for me, it was easy to be an athlete. It's like, here's what I need to do. I'm not going to party. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to be the best at what I do. Yeah. So that's how it just, I'm like, now in life, I'm like, there's a lot. I, was, I just missed it. So I still wanted to treat myself as an athlete, even though I was being, I was, I was in the normal world. Yeah. And then it just, it just grew with me. I'm like, okay, this, this is what discipline is. Mm -hmm. And that's what wins and what says the losses. Mm -hmm. It's a cool way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So tell us more about what some of those sort of principles are that you live by that you put down to, to, to having that sort of athlete perspective. That you put in the work and, and the real work, not the work of you watching a YouTube video that motivates you and you don't do shit about it. You know, so the, the real work. And when you put in the work, it doesn't guarantee you any results. So when it comes game day, you just accept that this game day, you know, that, that's one of them. Because um, that that's a difficult one for people. People always want that insurance policy, right? If I do this, I get that. Or if I, if I go to the school, I should have that job. Or if I look like this, I should have that. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's one. Uh, the second thing is that um, setbacks are always going to be there. No matter what you try to do, you're going to get hurt somehow. You're going to, so you're going to lose money. You're going to lose someone. You're going to lose a friend or you're going to get sick. Or you're going to get married and get a divorce. Um, but they're just, there's no, it's inevitable. So that the notion that you can set up yourself and have a shield 
to protect you from that from these lets you know set you know setbacks whatever you want to call them is just ludicrous but when they hit it's how you treat them you know so if they hit if you're out for five months six months if it's achilles tendon if it's acl you don't quit you start rehab the next day you don't feel sorry for yourself you start rehab the next day so you, the mindset is like yep it's part of it it's part of the game i'm hurt okay but let's just keep going those are the two fundamental ones for me, I think. Yes, yeah. And you talk about in your uh, bio about having an intention for your life. And when I asked you for a few questions before we started, one of the uh, phrases you used was choosing to live your life. Um, and you've mentioned that about your book as well. So clearly that intentionality is really important for you. Is that something that you've always had and how was that affected when your daughter was ill? When my daughter was, when I found out about the cancer, I was doing really, really well. Um, and I was very, very arrogant. Uh, I lived in a big house. Uh, I had a Hummer at a very young age, wore a big wall. I was just an obnoxious prick at that time. And, uh, which, and when, when I got the call, it took me a couple of days to realize like, oh, there's nothing I can do about this. So I can't talk to someone. I can't, I can't be anywhere. Just, it, it is what it is. And then when they, when they told me it was uncurable, in the sense that we don't know, they call it an undifferentiated tumor. So they don't know what it is. So they have to try different courses. Yeah. And to battle that for two years and to somehow get lucky, because I got very lucky in the sense that the, the story is very simple. We had to do radiation. Radiation back then would basically annihilate anything in its way. So where's the tumor? It would kill the tumor, but it would also kill whatever organ was there. So they told us we got the cancer in con uh, under control, but she won't be able to walk. Mm. And you know that when you hear that, and I know there are parents listen to this, it, it, it's a very, very tough call. It's like, it's, it's a very, very hard thing to hear. Yeah. Uh, especially with babies, because you can't tell them, you can't have the conversation. And so on my way out, this is, someone said, there's a guy down in Florida that does a different type of radiation. So we drove down and she's with us today. You know, I'm just the long story short, she's with us today. Mm -hmm. And so the intention part comes like, it's not that I was good. It's not that, you know, but I was fortunate enough to be in the US at the time. I was fortunate enough that the person was there. I was fortunate enough to be in Atlanta, close to Florida, where that went down to Florida. I was fortunate enough to, to be able to afford this stuff, even though I was self-employed with no insurance. But all this has to have a meaning behind it, right? So if I'm in a position right now to give back, that becomes my intention. And giving back is not a diluted term like, you know, I'm lucky, let's let's go for Christmas, give 10 bucks here and 10. No, I'm talking about really giving back. It, it, this can't all just happen for no reason. You get it? So th there's gotta be a, re and I'm not looking for the reason why it happened. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna give back as much as I can until, until, until I can't. Yeah. So that's 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 where my intention comes from because the story I can tell you the story in in a, in a very dramatic way and I can I can bring tears to you and your audience but I, it's it's an optimistic thing for me because honestly that's, I was walking out that she said she's not gonna, and she was a really really rude doctor bad man and she just said she can't walk so she hit us really hard like I wanted to kill her at the time and then when we walked out this, this sweetest older nurse is like go down to this guy here's his name i don't even know how to get his number and that's it so that was you know it's not i i don't think it's just luck there's got to be something behind it and that's what i'm trying to do right now hmm. so how you you mentioned that you were i think you used the word obnoxious um you you sort of had a different attitude before that happened and, and clearly a, a very different attitude now can can you articulate how that developed how that changed can you see where that actually changed in the moment yeah see 2008 2009 remember this is this is pre-instagram world yeah so when i say i was obnoxious i'm like old school obnoxious you know like <laughs> You know, like real stuff, you know, not, nothing is rented, no pictures, no one is seeing you. So for you to be seen, you have to actually be seen. There, there's, there's no broadcasting method. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and at a young age, when, you're, when you start to make a little bit of money and people are, are liking you, what happens is like you, you think you're invincible. 
right? So you think if you work out, you look, you, you know, you look half decent shape and you, you got some money, you got the car, you got the house. So you get very, very angry. I got very arrogant. I, I didn't think of there could be a bad day. I thought even if there was a bad day, there's enough money or there's enough contact or network around the world that would save me. But yeah. then once it happened, that, this is when you realize it's like, you don't have any control. You don't have it. You, you don't know what comes tomorrow, mm. you know, good or bad. And so it's easy for us to always assess it when things go bad, right? We tend to do that, right? If something goes bad, like why me or how did it happen? But when things are going well, you don't think about it. So I could sit and ask you, like, why did I meet that nurse that day on my way out? Why did I go to that specific hospital to meet that person? You yeah. know, so that's so that humbled me so much. And then I looked at myself then and I was like, dude, you're so average. You're so average. Your grades are average. You don't have a skill. You don't have a talent. You're not, you're not tall. You're not big. You're not strong. You're not fight. You know, so I, I started seeing myself in a, you know, not necessarily in a harsh way, but in a, it's just a, it's a real way. All that stuff is, is fake. And so if you, so to make up for the averageness, so you could maybe be good. <laughs> maybe, maybe try to be nice or, you know, I guess that's how I was processing when I was younger. Yeah. But when I got older, I'm like, yeah, being average is cool. You can be average and still do big things. Yeah. You know, you know the, it, on social today that you don't see that, right? You, you, you only see that the most talented or the most brilliant minds in the world. That's what we use. We only read their books, but no yeah. one, no one's, no one averages out there that you can think of on top of your head. Yeah. Like he's the most, the best athlete, the best coach, the best, you know, software, pro, whatever. It's just always the best. But the average people are just, you know, like myself, just, somehow just accepted the status quo that you're not going to do something big. So that's why I want to do this thing with the women's run. It's like, yeah, I want to do something big and it's going to be frictional. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I want, and I want to do it as, you know, as big as I can. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does so, that make yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you almost, will do and will stand out because of as you say that sort of average bit <laughs> for exactly that reason you just said that it's true isn't it true that whenever um people publish a, a business book they're always a best-selling author like every book must be best-selling how can it be <laughs> everything right yeah but it's like yeah 90 of the people, I, I don't want to give percentage but how many people have just accepted the fact that because they view themselves as average is that they're just going to accept a lesser of something, lesser of life or lesser of this. Uh -huh. That's not right. I don't think it's right at all. Yeah. You know, I, I do, do great things and be with great people. And, uh, you know, even, even your loved ones can be so special, even if you're average, you just, you know, just that notion of, oh, and being nice. How about winning when you're nice? How yeah. about, you know, how about you? How about the idea that for the past 10 years, we were only seeing like the only the assholes win, right? So only these really rough, ruthless guys, whether it's on TV, whether whether it's in Silicon Valley, what do you see? You only see that that one boss or that one guy. Mm. How about no, screw that? How about not being obnoxious is cool and not being a douchebag is great. Yeah. And, and you wouldn't be nice. Yeah, and you can still be evil. How about that for a notion? Yeah. That, that could be your marketing strap line. Don't be a douchebag. <laughs> yeah, you did. I was just talking to someone earlier today. I had a different podcast in the morning and, and that's what I said. I said, that's just my, my thing is just don't be a douchebag. Cause I was that douchebag. <laughs> you know, I was that oily just douchebag. It's big yeah. time. Douchebag. You're the guy that would drive in with a Hummer, make sure that it's so loud, make sure that he parks it wrong, that everyone can see him. And then when, uh, what gets out of the Hummer is everything, every bit of 5.9. You're like, what the hell? Who's that midget coming out of the car? It's like, but you know, to me back then it was different. Mm -hmm. you know, now I'm just completely the opposite. I'm completely, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just much more quiet. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us what your, what your days look like. How do you do what you do? And how do you fit it all in? <laughs> so, um, wake, I wake up really early. I, I wake up at five and, uh, from, from five, the first thing I do is I take a cold shower and then I meditate. Um, um, and I do some breathing work. So I, uh, not too long. I do 10 minutes in 10 minutes. I don't turn on my phone at all. Don't look at any WhatsApps or emails anywhere um, until I've gone to work out. I go work out for an hour. I come back. I usually, I, I'm usually on intermittent fasting, so I don't eat in the morning. Um, and then I do some journaling, five minutes. Sometimes there's nothing to write, but I just, just to get out there. And then I just start writing my day. 
And what I mean by that is not, not my tasks. What do I want my day to look like? What, and then I have another book that uh, I write in it. Um, what's the most important thing I need to do today? And I stick to that and I write the date uh, that I need to do that. And then say about 8.39, I start turning on my phone when all these messages come in. <laughs> but by then I've controlled the day. Um, then I go to work. Uh, I go have a late lunch at around two. That's when I break my fast. Uh, and then I, I do a power nap with, in, the, in the office for like 10 minutes. Um, uh, and then I come back and I, and just, I, I do it all again. I, I like to go out a lot. I like to, I like to work hard and go out at night a lot, but I like to go out early mm -hmm. and sleep. But if, if given the option, I go out every day and meet people. That's, that's my thing. I like yeah. to meet as many people as I can every single day. So can I ask you about your power nap? I don't know how many people are in your office, um, but I'm intrigued as to how how that works. Do you go and hide in a cupboard or something, or have you got one of those posh napping pods, or, or how does it no, work? No, no, no. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, what I do is I face the window. <laughs> I just put my my, my um, you know my, my my earpiece in, and I just I just listen to white noise. Yeah. So uh, you know, I, I do have my feet up on something, just so, but I do actually get to actually sleep, and I and I have an aura ring. So I make sure that it registers that I actually did take a nap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, that, that's honestly, how it's, it's it's not that difficult. Yes, yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never been very good at naps, even when I'm really tired. Well, the only time I ever used to do it, I think I've said on the podcast before, was when I used to work in a national role. I used to drive a lot, and I think I've slept in the car parks of most of the service stations. <laughs> <in> the <UK. laughs> I was quite good at it then, but not not quite so good now. <laughs> Ironically, oh dear. So what about? Uh, sorry, it's so important. Like that power nap, make up for so many coffees that you'd have. You know that you know that down that you get after lunch. Yeah. If you try, if if people try that power nap anywhere, just for ten minutes, just yeah. to try, it's so it's so refreshing. You don't okay. wake up groggy. Have you tried one of the coffee power naps? You probably wouldn't do that in the afternoon, I suppose. Where you drink coffee before you before you nap, and then when you wake up, apparently you're even more. That's correct, though. See, I don't do coffee in terms of liquid. I have a gazillion caffeine pills everywhere, like an <laughs> addict. Every like in my pocket, they do, everywhere. So what I do, you're absolutely right. Before I nap, yeah. Actually, before I eat, so I can, so to, so they actually kick in. Uh, yeah. I make sure that so I I get the dose right, but I, but I cut my caffeine at four. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a coffee lover, I'm quite traumatized that you're having your caffeine in, in capsule form. <laughs> only, only, when I'm at, only when I'm at work, but you know, because, so, you know, um, I, don't, I don't like to drive to a Starbucks or anything like that. I'm waiting, I'm waiting in line. It's just too, I, I don't have that time to do that. <laughs> I think one of the advantages of working from home, the coffee machine's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, they know my husband works from home since the beginning of the pandemic. Oh my God, the amount of coffee we have to buy every month is ridiculous. I think we should start charging his company for it. <laughs> <laughs> so what about um uh technology how do you how do you use that in your life non-existent it's apart from your phone <laughs> everything's on my phone my kindles on my phone i read my books on my phone uh, you know the, the typical works of the email and stuff yeah um, but that but that's it i don't do i'm not i'm not really a gamer per se uh-huh uh, but uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really seek it that much. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I like to be somewhat normal. I, I respect it so much and what it can do for humanity. But you know, that, that's it. Just my phone. And have you got particular apps that you that you use a lot? I'm religious about Evernote. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, Although, I, hasn't it changed recently? I'm not. I'm not loving it so much at the moment. I'm hoping they're going to develop it back out of the doldrums. Have you found the same, or is it just me? No, it, it it is. It just looks weird. I, I it just or feels weird, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, Evernote, uh, G Tasks. I've been on that forever, um, and then uh, that's it. Yeah, that's it, really. Yeah. It. yeah. Anything to get me organized, you know. And then obviously the Aura Ring app, uh, Spotify. Yeah, that's it. So tell us more about the um, Aura Ring. I I saw, I saw it. I think recommended by. Dave Asprey, the bulletproof um, person, a long time ago, and then more recently, it pro cropped up in my in my uh, uh, sort of peripheral um, knowledge of something when um, Prince Harry got one. 
<laughs> but uh, tell us about why it's really good, what, what it does. It obviously monitors your sleep. Yeah, which is, which is huge for me, right? So in terms of productivity, a lot of people don't respect sleep. Uh-huh. There's not enough data out there to that you can see on a database. So I, I do have a whoop and I also have a whoop that's on my wrist, W-H-O-O-P, and I do have an aura ring as well. What they both do is that not only did it tell you about the sleep, they tell you how to stage your day. So in other words, if you if you had a, a rough night for whatever reason, mm-hmm. it tells you that. And so if I if, if I wake up and I see myself in the, the, the aura, the, the, the whoop is in colored. It says, you know, it's red, yellow, or green. If I wake up in the red, I push back any important meetings. I don't work out that day. I make sure I sleep early. I take the day easy. The aura gives you scores, but it's, it's the same concept. So yeah. it, it measures your heart rate variability. Yeah. Um, and your sleep. So that's so cool. To me, yeah. I, I, so, so, you know, I wake up to it. But it, it, it's addictive in a way because if you wake up in the red or you wake up down, but you feel great. You're like, but it says I'm down. Should I just be down? You, you, yeah. you know? So it, 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 it's addictive in that nature. Because the first thing I do is when I wake up, I look at it. You check just, it. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I use um, sleep cycle to monitor my uh, sleep. Mm. And on the odd occasion, I haven't switched it on. I'm quite traumatized when I wake up in the morning and I can't tell how many <laughs> hours of, of what quality sleep I've had. Um, but I, I listened to a podcast once where the, the guy was saying, you know, oh, who needs those? you know, sleep monitoring things. I wake up and I know how I feel. And I sort of got what he was saying, but also um, understood that I don't think that is always the case because exactly what you've said. Sometimes I I wake up and I've had maybe not as much sleep as I thought I had or it's quality. been really good quality, but not quite as much or whatever. And there's all these like nuances. And, but... The other side of it is exactly what you said, that if it says you should feel a bit rubbish, then, you know, is it a bit psychosomatic and you do feel a bit rubbish <laughs> or do you anyway? <laughs> no, I tell you what I like about it. I tell you what, it's, it, it's um, the habitual stuff. Yes. So for those that drink a lot at night or drink even, even, you know, a little at night, it will tell you that. So you try to be pushed that up earlier or try to, to, try to, to lessen that. So I like that, you know, so it's not, I don't see it as a score, just a score. I'm seeing why am I might like that, you know, yeah. so... The, did I go out last night? Is that why it's red? Or did yes. I work out the red? Or maybe I was stressed. It's the yeah. internal stuff with the heart that a lot of people are missing. That's why that heart rate variability is just huge. That's why you hear about younger people with strokes and stuff is because of the heart, the weakness of the heart. Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, it's certainly true. You know, mine takes my pulse in the morning. And uh, if I've um, had a drink the night before, it's, it's normally higher. Um, and sometimes... If it's been a, you know, a special occasion, it's substantially higher. And then I think, oh, I shouldn't drink that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. as you say, it's, it's probably that one of the sleep cycle things you're, you're able to put in, you know, you've had a, a, a stressful day or you've eaten well or you've drunk or not or whatever. And I, I tend not to do that. But actually, as you say, it's that stuff that you start to see the patterns and make those decisions. I mean, I, I tend to use mine to firstly prove that I don't snore. <laughs> and secondly, tell my husband and daughter off for waking me up in the morning because it picks them up talking outside the door when she's about to go to school. <laughs> so I can complain they wake me up and they deny it. And then I say, here's the evidence. Even my phone heard you. <laughs> but I'm not sure it's supposed to be for that, to be fair. <laughs> no, it's not. That, I can assure you it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so what about working with other people outsourcing or delegating sharing tasks and so on you you've sounded like quite a a lone wolf up to now but you are working in an organization so presumably <laughs> you work with other people a lot of people yeah all, all the time like see again going back to this average thing and i don't um i compensate for everything that i don't know or don't know or don't or i'm not a at if, if, I, if I'm not an A plus at something, I always outsource. And we, we use the word outsource here. I don't mean necessarily just to outsource, but I find someone to compensate for that gap. Yeah. So I'm, that's why, you know, I, I never win alone because I just can't, you know. So that's why I'm always on this podcast, the same thing. I'm always striving to meet as many people as possible. They keep, they keep it so interesting for me, good mm-hmm. or bad. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. You know, I'm not, I'm not I, don't, I don't expect to meet angels all the time, but <laughs> it's, it's, um, people to me I you know are 
you know, no matter what technology does, no matter what all these companies do, at the end, there is someone transacting with someone. So if yeah. you're buying on Amazon, people forget that, right? If you're buying on Amazon, you're drinking coffee, whatever it is, even if, whatever, even if you're betting on a game, there is some human form. And so being on Zoom doesn't change the fact that I'm talking to you, right? You're, you're there. You're, you're physically there and I'm here. Yeah. So you know, we do exist. You know, yeah. so that's what I, that, that's, people forgot that. That's not going to go away, ever. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Um, you mentioned sort of Zoom and talking and, and so on. There's been so much publicity and talk over the, the time of the pande pandemic of how difficult it is to communicate online and how, you know, not seeing people in person is an issue and everything else. And yet there's so many stories and reasons why that's the other way. I was talking to... Um, my previous guest uh, earlier today and she was talking about having attended a Tony Robbins event and some of my um, members in my membership site were, were there and they were telling me stories about he had thousands of people there for like 12 hours all on Zoom and he had like whole walls of people's faces and he'd like pick people out and say you know Peter you know what do you think and things like that and it's it's interesting that you know you can't I suppose you can't replace face to face that probably is a truth but there's a lot you can do in these situations you know we're in different countries but we're having a really in my view interesting conversation um and connecting and all that sort of stuff and we can't even see each other because I always do these interviews with the video off <laughs> um and and I I find them really engaging and really um uh, very much about relationship building and yet a lot of the narrative through the pandemic in the in the media has been how rubbish it is to communicate online and using zoom and so on i i, I disagree i don't know i could be disagree the yeah. fact that you can meet more people understand more people uh, by the way meetings what, what whatever happened in meetings the, the reality of it like you go out there you do you commute for an hour you sit there for an hour and what you actually get done is probably 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the, isn't that the truth? That's, that's, meetings are, are, are useless. All that business travel was a waste. All these, you know, nothing really actually happened. All these silly conferences meant nothing. They're yeah. just like, mandatory because that's, that's just the way it is. It's like that old HR menu that we just have to have, right? Yeah. It's like, but it's bad. It, it doesn't work. Yeah. What Zoom did, in my opinion, it put everyone on the spot. So yeah. you have to come to Zoom prepared. You have to actually exist. So you can't, you know, you can go to a meeting hungover, but on Zoom, everyone's on the spot. And so, yeah. I, especially when you have to turn the camera on, it's like, oh, he's right there, she's right there. You know, we, we got, it's game day, you know? So no, I know, I think Zoom is awesome and it's gonna stay. I don't think anyone's gonna wanna go back to these conference rooms or do anything like that. No, and I, I mean, I do think it's it's a bit sort of, you know, horses for courses and I'm, I'm always talking, uh, in terms of engagement and leadership around treating people as individuals and and you know some people really do value the face-to-face -face stuff um I, I'm a bit of an introvert so I was really pleased that everyone came to me because I can stay at yeah. home and still see everybody all around the world it's brilliant <laughs> but right. I know not everyone is like that but it is interesting how the narrative seemed to be and seems to be you know that it's all about being in person and, and I don't think that is as you say true and also not practical in lots of situations and honestly, like I used to travel a lot to, to, to look at deals and look at different investments. Now, I, now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at four or five a day. Yeah. yeah. So no, no, it's, just, it's so much more efficient. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember it, talking, talking about work and stuff. So I think, that, I think that's where that people get that confused. I'm not talking about you having your girlfriend on Zoom where you have to see her and touch her and talk to her. That, that, that's different. But yeah. for work, you just want to get it done. Yes yeah right it's yeah different. and the the advantage of course was that everyone did it at the same time and there was no choice so whether people wanted to or not we were all able to do it I mean that's as I say my flippant comment about you know right. everyone came to me everyone did what I wanted them to do which was meet online um you know that it, w it was difficult to get that to happen in the past because of the expectations of meeting in person and thinking that was better and everything else but of course we were able to sort of practice all this for nine months or it might even be 12 months by the time this is published um with you know with no ch real choice and as you say there's been so many opportunities that have come out of that I mean even just today my daughter's working 
at home this week because it's Christmas, as you know, <laughs> um, yep. next week. And um, we didn't want her to be at school potentially exposed um, leading into Christmas in case we had to then isolate. So she's working from home and they've got a Google Classroom. So nearly every class that she has, she can participate in from our kitchen table, which is, you know, mm -hmm. so so amazing and they wouldn't have been able to do that this time last year because there was no need and they'd never done it before and they didn't need to do it sort of thing it's interesting yep completely yeah so what about learning and improving as you as you go through Every your life your life has changed tons <laughs> over um the time how do you keep learning and keep improving it's it's uh, i love to learn uh it's it's uh, um, it's it's a challenge um so i learn all the time like i'm i'm, I'm in that mode I've, I've always been in that mode uh, but I actually learned to actually, uh, what's the, I learned to do, you know, so I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't learn just to like, oh, I've learned this. No, I learned to do, you yeah. know, so I'm always seeking out new information, you know, uh -huh. so just whatever it is, new, whatever. And I call it information and then we just learn from the information. Uh -huh. you know, so, and that's another thing technology is awesome about and Zoom is awesome about. Yes. So yeah. it is, it's so easy for me to get, to get, to get on a podcast or to get on a, webinar and just learn something new, even if it's just communication skills. Just, uh, yeah. So that's, that's a mandate of mine that I do every week. I check my journal to make sure, did you learn something new this week? It doesn't matter what it is, mm. you know, whether it's about health or, uh, you know, finances or anything, anything. I just, mm. uh, you know, philosophy, I'm, I'm all about that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I like that learn to do. The other one is um, just in time learning, isn't it? To take the yeah. Um, logistics phrase and and use that so I always like that as well as opposed to the old shelf learning <laughs> where we used to buy it and stick it on the shelf and then never do anything with it <laughs> yeah, right now I think it's you know I fear the amount of people that hide behind learning yes you know, so that people that go out there to get their masters because they don't want to face the real world or you know they're learning this new language which just means nothing to them you know so oh. you've got to learn that something to better you because if it betters you you will succeed and if you succeed you will help others yeah yeah right does that make sense absolutely I, I do think learning often is procrastination people often know enough to take action but they don't because they convince themselves that they don't know enough and it's not about not knowing enough it's about being insecure or not confident enough or or not seeing the opportunity or whatever so it can be a real procrastination tool i think yeah, yeah it, it's a hiding tool especially with these degrees and it's all these certificates everywhere yeah yeah yeah. yeah it's, 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 everyone hides you know everyone but a lot of people hide behind them because mm. apparently if you get that degree or that certificate and hide from the real world when you get them apparently the world is going to reward you so much yes yeah so Last couple of questions, Mohammed. Um, firstly, what about those days where it all goes horribly wrong? How do you deal with those? When what? I'm sorry. When it all goes horribly wrong, when you have a bad day, how do you deal with that? Um, the first thing I do, uh, I've worked on this for a while now, so but I, I can say it now because it's easier. But I work on my breathing. So I, I sit back and I realize that okay, so I sit and do all these breathing exercises, and then it calms me down. Uh -huh. Then I just realized that it's just one day out of so many days, or it's one deal out of so many deals, or it's one bad person out of 7 billion people in the world. <laughs> you know, so you, you, you need that one thing. It's, it's, it's easy for me to say, I just become optimistic at the end of the day, but it's not, I, I need that control mechanism, which is that breathing exercise. So I, I sit there and do all that breathing until I just calm down. Mm -hmm. And then I just acknowledge, oh, it's not that bad. Who cares? There's tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing, right? So it, it's so temporary. Everything is going to be so temporary. It, yeah. But we just have to exaggerate it. We just think it's the biggest thing or the biggest deal or the biggest divorce or the biggest bankruptcy. Like, you know, like we, like we know what comes tomorrow, but that's never the case. You know, so that's what I've learned that, but it's easy for me to say now at 43. Yes. That wasn't how I, you know, thought of the bad days. Bad, bad days were like, oh man, I'd be so dramatic. <laughs> and you know like music in the background dramatic you know what i mean like, it's like oh this is the end of days this is it i'm yeah. never gonna come back from that yeah yeah, yeah. today I I just like hard about it much more yeah i suppose you have to go through some of those days where you felt like it was the end of the world to realize the next day that it wasn't as it turned out the end of the world and therefore you get more aware of that <laughs> and that's part of the thing about being older isn't it i guess <laughs> no i think i, I I think if you're fortunate enough at a younger age to go through something difficult, 
So mm-hmm. I don't think it's about age so much. I think if it's if it's, it's what you experience. Experience. And so those that try, it, those that put themselves out there, are by default going to experience more things. Yeah. Those that are hiding, yeah, then the then the age thing matters. You know, then you say, okay, I'm going to get to that at that age. So okay. when when I'm more mature, but you could be 18 and put yourself out there and 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 have a really harsh lesson yeah. on finances or, or 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 romance or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, that sort of building that resilience. I mean, through the right. pandemic, I've sort of talked quite a lot about the whole, you know, living through the war in this country, yeah. um, for, you know, five years and how awful it was and everything else. You know, that built such a lot of resilience in that generation. And, um, you know, this will have done, I wouldn't say it's going to be the same, but, you know, it's got elements of, of the same um, in terms yeah. of helping people's resilience for whatever is going to come next sort of thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a dark it's a dark place it's, it's definitely a dark place and I, and I and i acknowledge that what's crazy about it is just a flu and so for anyone out there you know who's just who's arrogant or thinks they're so cool how about just a flu that brings the entire world to its knees you gotta think about that for a minute it's mm. just a flu. it's not it's, it's not it's not a war it's not it's nothing but it's just a flu and we don't know what comes next we're in lockdowns shops are closed it's just just, you got to think about this. Uh, on that note, if you, if you don't mind, you know, I say if you're healthy today or, or, or if you're just good in whatever shape or form, I think you should just think about it and say, this is so cool that we're, I'm actually around, that I actually can do, that yeah. there is a tomorrow for me and mm-hmm. for my loved ones. You know what I mean? Because like, the amount of people that can't say that is no. so much, yeah. you know? We can hide from it, but it's just so much. It, they're in the millions, mm-hmm. not thousands, millions. Yeah. That's a scary thought. But you know, just for those, I think we should be more optimistic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows when this goes out in April, we might be in a, in a different place. She said optimistically. <laughs> I mean, we have no choice. No, no. Yeah. Really? You know, your whole view of everything in life should be very different after that. You can, this is not one of those things that you say, oh, we forgot about that. No, 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 you're not going to forget about that. No. 20, you can't forget 2020. You can no. pretend to write it off, but you're scarred for life. Yeah. <laughs> we will be telling our grandchildren about it. <laughs> yeah. so, last question then. What about those days where you get to live more? And that's where I describe as uh, what I describe as uh, getting to do more of the things that you want to do and less of the stuff that you don't want to do. What do those days look like for you? I never credit myself for those days. Oh, I never credit when that when those days happen. I acknowledge them and I never credit them for myself. I never say this happened because I worked hard at this or I did this right. I'm just so appreciative of whatever reason this that day's happening. And so I've got so much more gratitude for that day. And I just sit and just analyze every minute of it of how cool that day was or how cool this event was on that day. Uh-huh. And I just always say. It's not because of me. It's because of something else. And yet you are building an intentional life. Yes. So how do you reconcile those two things? So you're making choices all the time and trying to make good choices and then good things happen. How do you then reconcile saying it's just, you know, it wasn't me sort of thing? Challenging because, question, that is. <laughs> no, 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 see, we, we, we talked about that in the beginning. It's like, because see, it goes back to the thing I said in the beginning. I work so hard at something. And let's, let's just call it the intentional life. Yeah. If we all knew that working at that one thing resulted in this, then there would be no failure, right? So yeah. my, I'm like, there are a million people, a gazillion people that are working just as hard or are better than me at this thing or, or, or. Mm-hmm. And so... When the good thing happens, I just want to stay humble. I don't want to be like what, the version of myself when I was young. So that's mm-hmm. why I don't credit myself at all for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, this conversation we have, I'm not. I don't. I don't know what happens after. I don't know who calls me or who reaches out to me. But maybe it's the best thing that ever happens to me. Just mm-hmm. you know. So I walk into the podcast thinking that, but it's not because we rehearsed it or because I'm so good or so eloquent or such a good storyteller. It's just. Maybe there's that one person that's going to change my life listening on the other line who's going to email me tomorrow or text me tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's just pulling at both ends, if, if that makes sense to you. Yes. Yeah. Got to be intentional, yes, but, but trying to control the results or expecting the results is, ludic- is ludicrous, especially after the pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. 
So it's been really interesting talking to you today, Mohammed. Tell people how they can find out more about you and get in touch. Well, um, well on the show, uh, with show notes, I'll send you the website. It's the best yep. place to work. And from there, everything's on that. I'll send you that website right now. Brilliant. I have it. <laughs> It'll be on the show notes. <laughs> That's excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All this information is available in the show notes. If you go to powertolivemore.com forward slash, in this case, 205, then you'll find them there. And this week, I'd like to talk to you about accountability. It's my topic for the week within the fundamental for the month, which is share. So accountability for me is at a number of levels. The first is about self-accountability. So what do you commit to to yourself and how do you ensure that you achieve those things and stay accountable to yourself? And how do you do that? So I use Todoist as my to-do list and I use it quite extensively to plan what I'm going to do and to review what I've done and what I haven't done and to sort of think about how I can do things better and on time and more effectively and efficiently and all that sort of stuff in the future. So there's that self accountability piece. Then it's about accountability on a one to one basis with somebody else. And that might be a friend or a business colleague, or it might be a mentor or a coach. So how do you use that relationship to keep you accountable? And then there's group accountability. So maybe as part of a coaching group or something like my membership site where there's a community and we have regular calls and people share what they're going to do and come back and report on whether they've done that or not. And then there's things like group programs and group coaching and that sort of thing as well. So that group accountability. And then there's generally that whole thing about external accountability by saying publicly that you're going to do something and then in effect being or rather, in effect, holding yourself accountable to what you've committed to, because you know that there's a whole load of people out there waiting for whatever it is you said you were going to do. I think that all of us can benefit from accountability in some shape or form. And part of what we need to do is work out what works best for us. As I said, it might be personal accountability. It might be that you need one other person to hold you accountable. It might be that you need to do things in public so that people can see And then that keeps you accountable or maybe it's in a group scenario. So my question to you for this week is, how are you keeping yourself accountable or how are you finding other people to keep you accountable? If you need one to one accountability or group accountability or public accountability, any of those, then you might be interested in my power to live more calm membership. One of the four areas of calm is accountability. So it's something that we do specifically focus on in all sorts of ways to account for people having different styles and different tendencies. So if you're looking for some ways to keep you accountable, then it might be worth looking at powertolivemore.com forward slash get calm. Or if you'd like to have a chat, then go to powertolivemore.com forward slash calm call. And we can have a conversation to see how I might be able to help you and how I might be able to keep you accountable. Again, this week's show notes are at powertolivemore.com forward slash 205. And we look forward to speaking to you next week. Use your power to live more. 